You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 1, page 37. This is Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Today's story is stalled by Merrill Page. Merrill Page was born and raised in Sacramento, California. He is a television news editor by night and by day... Wait, isn't it supposed to go the other way? By, By day, he mostly takes care of his three kids. When he finds a bit of free time, he writes or tries to or wants to but usually doesn't. He has managed to string 100 words together cohesively, and those words were recently heard on the Drabblecast. Now he's the star of our show with his most recent effort. Stalled by Merrill Page. Gina smiled warmly at him as he walked into the office. She did that every day. Rob could tell that she was interested in him, but he did his best to keep her at arm's length. He liked her as well, a lot. But after working with her for two years, he knew what kind of a girl she was. She was pleasant, fun, easy to talk to, and attractive. But she was also a commitment. She wasn't a one-nighter, or even a one-monther. If he ever showed interest in return, he was in for a year at least. Or he could break her heart and be in for a lot of hard feelings and resentment. He didn't want to have to deal with something like that, with a person he would see every day at work. He liked the ladies, but he preferred the ones he could meet at a club one night and forget about the next morning. Someday it would be time to commit to a relationship, but not now. Hi, Gina, Rob said, kind but not too friendly. Rob was utterly focused. He had lofty goals in life, and he did his best to avoid distractions that could derail his progress. This attitude had served him well. He had been the number one sales associate at Thompson Media for the last two years in a row. He had his eye on the VP of sales position, and he knew for a fact it was going to be open within the next two years. Nose to the grindstone for just a little while longer, and he would be out of the sales bullpen and into the corner office where he could simply supervise and let the other associates do the dirty work for him. Hey, Rob, Bill Llewellyn said as he passed his cubicle. Hey, Bill, Rob said. Bill was the type of person Rob was trying to avoid becoming. He was strictly a 9-to-5 guy. When Rob had tried ribbing Bill about falling short in the number one sales associate award for the second year in a row, Bill had confided in Rob that he didn't care at all about the company's bottom line or any accolades they might bestow on him. He had a wife and two beautiful children at home, and he wanted to spend as much time with them as he could. So once he'd earned his paycheck, he clocked out. Rob's main competition was Terence McGill. That guy was seriously driven. Most days it was a competition between Rob and Terence to see who would log more hours in the office. Rob usually checked Terence's cubicle before he left each day to make sure he was the last one out the door. If he was still there, Rob would make one more call. After that call, if he was still there, he'd make one more. It was a shock for Rob to see that he had beaten Terence to work today. His cubicle was still empty. Rob had been caught in a traffic jam on his drive in and had been sure he would be the last associate to arrive. After all, even slackers like Bill were already here. What's up with Terrence? Did he call in sick? Rob asked Bill. I don't think he called in sick, Bill said. He must just be late or something. Then Bill turned his back on Rob as the person he was calling answered the phone. Rob strode on down the aisle to his desk. He unloaded his briefcase, switched on his computer, and, while he waited for it to boot up, walked to the bathroom to pee. He liked to use the men's room in the back of the building. While the one in the front of the building was larger and closer to his desk, Rob preferred a little privacy while eliminating his waste. He spent so much time each day being the gregarious, cheerful salesman that he felt he deserved an actual break when he took a break. The last thing he wanted to do was chat with someone in the bathroom. He pushed open the door and strolled in. There was one urinal and two stalls. The larger of the two stalls, the one equipped for handicapped people, was occupied. Luckily, there was no one else in the small bathroom. He had managed to pee in peace once again. 
he went back to his desk and got to work. It was a rough day. Everyone had them on occasion. Even the best of the sales associates, like Rob, ran into hard days. After all, he was trying to get people to part with their money. Rob was glad of the fact that he dealt with businesses, not individual customers. Buyers at businesses were much more likely to part with money than individuals. After all, it wasn't their money. And how could a business grow if they didn't advertise? It was a win-win situation. He only had to convince them of that fact, which he was very good at. Today, however, he didn't do so well. He was grumpy and wanted to leave early. Well, early for him. Bill was already gone, of course, and most of the rest of the sales associates. It was days like this that Rob had to soldier through to become the best, though. He promised himself that he wouldn't leave until Terence did. He stood up and peered down the aisle to Terence's desk. He couldn't see him. Had he gone already? Unbelievable. He walked closer until he could see for certain that Terence was gone. Then he smiled broadly. He really did want to pack it in early today, and now there was no reason not to. He walked back to his desk and loaded up his briefcase. Gina walked into his cubicle and smiled her inviting smile at him as she dumped a folder filled with contracts on his desk. She put a hand on his arm. She was a very touchy person. I faxed all these for you, Rob, so you should be good to go. I'm heading out. You don't need anything else? No, I'm good. I'm heading out, too, he said. What? Already? That's not like you, Rob. Well, it's been a crappy day, so I'm just going to end it now. She touched his arm again. Hey, I was going with Jill and Jermaine to Old Ironsides for a drink on the way home. Do you want to come with us? Her perfume hit his nostrils right at that moment. It was intoxicating. He looked at her, took in her face, her slim figure, her long black hair, her round hips and full lips. He desperately wanted to say yes. She was the kind of woman that he could spend a life with and never grow tired of. He could imagine himself making and raising children with her, leaving work every day at five on the dot to rush home to them, and doing everything he could think of to please them. He suspected his life might be much happier than it was now, where his sole joy came from his accomplishments. But she was a commitment. If he gave in to commitments too soon, he would never achieve his goals in life. It just wasn't the right time. Settling down with a family was for later, when he could give them all the things they would deserve. No matter how badly he wanted this woman, now was not the time. I'd love to, Gina, but I can't. I've uh, got to take my car to the shop, and tonight's the only night I'll have time. Sorry. That's fine. She said crestfallen, but trying to hide it. Maybe next time. Yeah. Rob said. Maybe next time. He felt bad for turning her down. He knew how hard it was to lay it on the line. He was a salesman, after all. Gina walked out of the bullpen and disappeared from sight. He watched her go, groaning inwardly. It was torture to deny himself like this every day. But he was determined. He could get involved with someone like her after he was successful and rich. He grabbed his briefcase and started for the door. Then he veered off towards the bathroom. His drive home was long, so he figured he'd better use the facilities before he left. He made the long walk to the back bathroom. There was someone in the big stall again so he entered the smaller one. He liked the smaller one better anyway. The toilet in the big stall was taller, necessary for the handicapped regulations, he supposed, so it was uncomfortable. He relieved himself, then exited the stall and washed his hands. Then he grabbed his briefcase and left. Gina was smiling at him as usual when he walked in the front door the next day. Good morning, Rob she said, rows of white teeth flashing brightly. Hi, Gina, he said. How was last night? It was fun. You should have come. He strode purposefully to his desk, dropping greetings on each associate as he passed. He'd tried to leave a little early this morning, and he saw that it had paid off. He'd beaten Terrence in to work again. It turned out to be a much better day than the one before. His calls were very fruitful. He left the building at 10 o'clock for a golf game with a client and was treated to another glowing smile from Gina on his way out. He golfed poorly, but it didn't really matter to him. He didn't even like golf much. He only did it because most of his clients liked to. It worked, however, because his client agreed to a large buy at the end of the game. Maybe he was buoyed by his sound victory over Rob. Who knew? But Rob was happy to lose badly if it meant winning what mattered to him. 
He'd done so well today it made yesterday look like Black Friday. Terrence was already gone, so Rob decided to head home early. He stopped into the bathroom on his way out the door, and he noticed again that the big stall was occupied. As he settled into the smaller one, he considered how odd it was that the other stall had been occupied the last three times he'd come in here. So few people used the bathroom. Almost every other time Rob used it, he was alone. Even if he spent 15 minutes in the stall, virtually no one disturbed his solitude. Maybe it was the same person in that stall each time, and they just happened to be on the same elimination schedule as Rob. He always stopped into the bathroom on his way out the door. Maybe this guy did too. Whoever he was, he was ripe. The bathroom was stinking. Was there even a guy there? Rob wondered. He hadn't heard any rustling from the stall since he'd been there. When someone plugged the toilet or the toilet broke, often they closed the door and locked it from the inside until it was fixed. He became curious, so he leaned down, looking for shoes. They were there, tasseled loafers. So it was a guy stinking up the place. Probably a sales associate, judging by the loafers. Engineers were usually the ones who used this back bathroom, but they didn't wear loafers. Holy crap, he thought. It's probably Terrence McGill. He hadn't gone home yet, after all. Rob grimaced. He was going to have to go back to his desk and make one more call. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Gina. How are you today? Great as always, she said. Her smile brightened his morning as usual. He'd been in late last night. He was making calls, waiting for Terrence to appear from the bathroom. But after an hour, he never did. Rob thought that he'd been wrong in his assumption about the loafers. They must not have belonged to Terrence after all. Nobody takes an hour to go to the bathroom. Then he decided that he was, in fact, correct about the loafers, but that Terrence had left after using the bathroom without passing through the bullpen on his way out. As he headed for his cubicle, Owen, the VP of sales, stopped him. Hey, Rob, have you seen Terrence? I think I saw him in the bathroom yesterday, but other than that, I haven't really seen him all week. Why? Well, Owen said, frowning. One of his clients called me this morning looking for him. They were supposed to golf yesterday, and Terrence didn't show up. Rob thought that was particularly odd. Terrence, unlike Rob himself, loved to golf. He bragged day in and day out about his amazing golf scores. Rob had suggested to him that, since he was so wonderful and amazing, he should quit his job and join the Pro Tour. At the very least, it would give everyone's ears a rest. Terrence had said he might do just that. Owen continued, They said they called his cell and his home number, and they never got any response. I don't know, was all Rob could say. I haven't seen him. Rob sat down and moved on with his day. It came to a screeching halt just before lunchtime. On his way out the door for some food, Rob made his visit to the bathroom. Standing outside the door were two janitors, looking irritated. What's going on? He asked. Somebody says this bathroom stinks, so they call us to clean it, but there's somebody in there. The two janitors were both female, so they couldn't enter the men's room until it was empty. We've been waiting here 20 minutes. All right, well let me see if I can help you out. Rob pushed the door open and stepped inside. The janitors had not been lying. The bathroom smelled awful. It was similar to the smell he'd noticed the day before, only tenfold. Maybe Terrence hadn't flushed the toilet after he'd finished. The stench was overwhelming, and Rob had to cover his nose with his sleeve to avoid vomiting in the sink. The laundry detergent smell of his sleeve was just barely enough. Strangely, the bad smell didn't really resemble an excrement stink. Rob had smelled it before, but he couldn't place it. His stomach turned flips, and he realized there was only so long he was going to be able to withstand it. He had to take care of things and get out of here. Hello? There was no answer from the stall. Hey, the janitors need to clean up the bathroom, man. They need you to hurry out. There was still no answer. He stepped to the stall and knocked on the door with the hand not occupied with protecting his nose. Still nothing. Not even movement, feet shuffling, or anything. He bent over to peer under the stall partition, and he was shocked to see the same set of loafers he'd seen the day before. The same guy was in there. Still? Or was he back in there? Hey, are you okay in there? Hello? Rob banged on the stall door. It rattled loudly. It was hard to overcome his sense of impropriety, but the next time he banged on the door, it was with intent to enter. He whacked it with full force. The pin of the flimsy lock on the stall door shook out of its hole, and the door swung open. When Rob saw the man in the 
the stall, the vomit finally began to flow. Rob sat on the grass outside the building and watched the coroner wheel the body to the ambulance and drive away. Most of the people who had been working in the building that day were on the lawn with him, or had already left for home. Only the few whose jobs were deemed essential remained. Once the report of the dead body spread, no one wanted to stay anyhow. Most of the sales associates were wandering the parking lot, gabbing into their cell phones, not willing to waste a minute of the workday. But Rob couldn't get into the proper frame of mind to talk with clients. He pulled blades of grass from the lawn, staring at his hands, willing the images of the dead body out of his mind. The body had been gruesome by the time Rob finally discovered it. But the most terrifying thing in his mind was the fact that this had happened at all. Terence had been dead in the bathroom stall for at least three and perhaps as many as five days. An aneurysm in his brain had ruptured and he died in the middle of a bowel movement. Not until this morning had anyone noticed that Terence was missing. And who had called? Not his concerned family or friends. Just some irate client, angry at being stood up for a golf game. Terence was one of the best salesmen at Thompson. He, like Rob, was rolling in commissions. But people had forgotten that he was even alive the very moment that he died. No one even cared enough to get him off the toilet. Rob considered Terence a kindred spirit. They weren't friends. They were too similar and too competitive to be friends. But they had the same ideas and the same trajectory in life. They were both planning on landing on the top of the heap. But was this where he was heading? To a lonely death, forgotten in the crapper? Who was mourning for Terence McGill? He had many acquaintances at work, but no friends. Kind of like Rob. He knew that Terence was unmarried and wasn't seeing anyone seriously either. He had no children and no family in the area. Kind of like Rob. A lot of people were going to hear about Terence's death and think, that's too bad. They weren't going to cry. They weren't going to head out to the bar and drown their sorrows with beer. The only thing that might make them think more than a minute on him at all were the lurid details of his death. The whole idea terrified Rob. He didn't want to be that guy anymore. He believed that his life was on the fast track to riches and happiness. But in fact, he was stalled on the side of the road, going nowhere. He thought about his back-to-back sales awards and realized that they meant nothing. If Rob dropped dead on this patch of grass this very moment, no one would care at all. Rob threw the handful of grass he held in the air. The blade sprinkled down on him as he arose from his seat. He walked around the building, looking for someone. He saw her in a group of women quietly conversing on the sidewalk near the south corner of the building. Hi, Gina, he said. Oh, Rob, she said and stepped in and hugged him. He didn't flinch or shy away. He hugged her back strongly. It must be so terrible for you, she said into his ear, still hugging. Then she released him. You're the one who found him, weren't you? Yeah. It was... it was awful. She grabbed his hand and held it firmly. Listen, Gina, you want to go somewhere and get a drink or something? This whole thing, it's just got me thinking, and I just want to be with someone right now, you know? She squeezed his hand reassuringly. Sure, Rob. Let's get out of here. Where do you want to go? They started walking away, then Rob stopped. Okay, I didn't say what I mean. Let me try again. Gina, I don't want to just be with someone right now. I want to be with you. Author's note. The bathroom described and stalled exists in the real world. It resides in the building where I work my day job. I, like Rob, had the coincidental experience of going to the bathroom on three consecutive days and finding the same stall always occupied. I even checked for feet like Rob did. They were tasseled loafers. What if somebody had died in there? My mind was fascinated with the idea. It bounced around inside my skull for weeks. I knew it could really happen in today's world. But then again, so what? I had the germ of a story, but that was really all. I couldn't figure out what to do with it. Then I was talking with a friend of mine who was also a writer, and he gave me the nudge I needed to discover what the story was about. 
It's turned out to be one of my favorite stories that I've written. The concept isn't wild and fantastic, but the story's enjoyable. I hope that you took it for something to read, or in this case, listen to, in the bathroom. It's where I do my best reading, after all. Okay, that was our story stalled by Meryl Page. Thank you very much, Meryl, for that story. Uh, we'd just like to send out a call, a shout out, whatever you want to call it. We need some readers for our story. We have, uh, you've heard us do uh, a lot of these characters on our stories so far, but we are in short supply when it comes to females around here. Sadly, isn't it sad how short the supply is? Can anyway. I play the sad music? Oh, right. I love that song. I never get tired of that song. <laughs> so we need some female readers. Especially people from the UK and or Australia. We've got an Aussie story coming up that uh, you really don't want to hear how we do Australian accents. Is your name not Briss? Especially Australian people don't want to hear that because they are going to hate us. They're going to be so offended and want to kill. Good night, Bruce. I'm even more so than they normally are because it's a, a nation made up only of criminals. Oh, hello, Bruce. That's right. Hi, Bruce. Um, so anyways, females, uh, American females or UK females or Australian females and UK males, Australian males. We have plenty of American males going around here. Sick sausage party. Yeah, well well spoken, Bruce. <laughs> okay, if you are from one of those regions and you'd like to help us read a story, whether it's just a character or an entire story, please send us an email at editor at doonsteep.com. We would appreciate it greatly. Also, we would appreciate a donation. That's how we pay our authors. That's right. We are a paying market and we pay pretty much as much as we can based on what is sent to us. That's right. There's a PayPal button, a link right there on the website, doonsteef.com. And uh, click it, and please, uh, if you're able to, send a couple pounds our way. Or, or dollars lira. AUS. Ah, so don't send any pounds our way. That stands for Australian dollars. Oh, see, see that I didn't know. Australia, we love you. Amen. I recently saw Wally, the Pixar film that just was uh, released this summer, and I found a striking similarity in the themes from both Wally and this story that we just listened to, stalled by Meryl Page. And the whole idea of getting out there and, and living your life while you're alive, basically, because we all know that we are only going to live for so long. You know, hey, I saw Wally too, and we're both huge fans of Pixar. You know, it's, it's, it's infuriating how many imitators there are out there. But nobody comes even close to the depth or the emotion or the replay value of these Pixar films. And one of the things that I was most blown away by in Wally was that there was just so much stuff. Not just the theme that you mentioned, but all sorts of themes about the earth and about persistence and about love and about life and things like that, that I described it to my cousin because he doesn't go out to movies, that I thought it was first and foremost a science fiction film, secondly, a love story, and then thirdly, a children's film. And I don't know, there's probably a fourth and fifthly, too. That's the way it is with Pixar. There always is a fourth and fifthly. That's what I, you know, I've always thought Finding Nemo of the Pixar films is my favorite, my top. I, I like to rank them or something. And uh, that definitely has been number one for me for a long time. But me too. I I feel that there's the possibility that Wally may even supersede that. It may, you know, upon further viewings, because I've only seen it the one time, and it's hard to say whether it tops it or not. But it was a fabulous film. I was absolutely amazed by everything, and and just the balls the filmmakers had to go out there with a film like that you watch the first at least half hour and there's no dialogue whatsoever you know it's it's wally and 
sometimes he says his name, and I think sometimes the uh, other robot says her name or says his name. And aside from that, he runs over a cricket. I don't know. I mean, there's, there's. Wait, no... wait! You thought it was a cricket? Sorry, it not was a, a cockroach. You're right. It was a cockroach. Oh, okay. Because my niece thought it was a cricket too, <laughs> and I saw it with her. No, it was definitely a cockroach. And now, see, I I had seen a lot of that silent part at Comic Con last year in San Diego, and so I was worried taking my niece to it that maybe this one would be too adult, because unlike the the past Pixar films. Where the trailers have come out, and I felt like, oh, gosh, you know, that might not be my cup of tea. This one, from the very beginning, the trailers look like, holy cow, this is for grown-ups. This is something, I, I can't wait to see this movie. I mean, more so than Batman or Hellboy or even Indiana <laughs> Jones, I wanted to see Wally this summer. And the, the preview made it look like, do you remember a few years ago, Disney did this movie Dinosaur, which was basically a CG Tarzan, but with t- dinosaurs instead of an ape man. And the first trailer for that was just like three and a half minutes of nature and dinosaurs and walking and all that, and no dialogue at all. And I saw that trailer and I thought, holy cow, I can't wait to see this. Because it felt like finally there's an animated film that's for adults. It doesn't have, you know, tentacle rape in it. And... <laughs> And then I went and saw Dinosaur, and yeah, it's like the pre-credit sequence or the first minute and a half is those what we saw in the trailer, and then it becomes the love monkey and all this stuff that really disappointed me. You have told me about your impressions of Pixar in the past and just how you can tell how good a Pixar movie is going to be by how bad its trailer is because the trailers don't give you that feeling they focus on the fart jokes or the stupid little things and i suppose it's just the problem with the trailer you can't encapsulate something like the heart that pixar movies have versus the other imitators you know they have plenty of fart jokes in all the other movies but they don't have the heart they don't have the characters that you love they don't have the feeling that you're after and you know finding nemo i think had the worst trailer of all i saw that trailer at the beginning of pirates of the caribbean and it's like this summer there are x billion number of fish in the sea and he's trying to find one and it looked like this madcap screwball silly little thing for every child between the age of three and five and that was just about it and then it ended with that fart joke which made it look like oh well this is what the movie is all about it, this was post Shrek, after Shrek made you know three quarters of a billion dollars and all that. So it's like I, so everybody wants that kind of thing, and I always felt bad that Pixar seemed to be emulating its imitators, the people that were ripping it off. And so yeah, I thought, oh great, Finding Nemo. But I went because I had enjoyed Monsters Incorporated all the way up to Toy Story, and holy Nemo, I was just blown away by how good Finding Nemo was. And I, I remember saying to you at the time, where was all this heart and this passion and this pathos and this, this, this terror and this, you know, just the, the epicness that was in that movie? Why wasn't any of that in the trailer? Um, I mean, granted, it made like $340 million anyway, so other people didn't need that stuff to go see it. But I was just so disappointed that... None of that was in the trailer. And then the next one was Incredibles, right? And I guess the teaser trailer for that was him putting on the outfit, which was a good putting trailer. Putting belt and the buckle shoots but around. it frankly was a two-minute fat joke, that right. whole trailer. Right. And it didn't really convey what The Incredibles was to me. And once the real trailer started to come out and all that, they, yeah, they focused on the funny voices and the... I, I guess the stuff that was more kid-friendly in Incredibles, I mean, guess maybe that's where their dollars come from. But correct me if I'm wrong, it's the adults that pay the mission. Yeah. No, kids don't have money. Anyway, I, I really, really enjoyed Incredibles. And then the next one after that, I think, was Cars. And it had just the worst trailer. It was like, oh, no, <laughs> you have to be either really inbred, love NASCAR, or both for this movie to be up your alley. And, ooh, I struggled against going to see Cars because the trailer was just right there. And it's like, with Larry the Cable Guy, 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 you know. And, 
I, I've talked, I realized, for a long, long time. Uh, go ahead. What, what have been your impressions of Pixar's track record and then uh, their trailer? Three. Three. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's really interesting how, how, how that goes. Uh, the worse the trailer is, the better the movie seems to be. And it's worked that way almost every time. And then here we go with trailer for Wally, and it wasn't a bad trailer for once. Maybe there just wasn't enough fart jokes that they could put them all in the trailer. I don't know. By the way, Finding Nemo's fart joke is the best fart joke ever, in case anyone was wondering. Anyways, you get a trailer that you watch it, and and instead of being turned off by this trailer, I was actually excited to go to the movie when I saw the commercials on TV and I saw the trailer. I thought, wow, this looks really cool. And I, I would like to go see that film again just to be able to take it all in again because I, I, I'm still kind of reeling I guess from it. Maybe I looked forward to it too much or something. That was what you were saying to me once. You look forward to it so much that uh, It was sensory overload for me. Right. So you, you just don't even know what. But gosh, it was wonderful. We'd like to encourage everybody out there to go and see Wally because seriously, it is wonderful. So all of our listeners, so yeah, Mr. John Smith of 23 Crescent Court, you, yes, you are still our only listener. So please go see Wally. They need another six bucks for that film to break even, I think. So please go and see it. And you won't be disappointed. You'll be even less disappointed than you are of this podcast, I'm sure, because it's disappointing. I know. Uh, now, are we done talking about Wally, or should we continue to talk about it? I don't know. Is there anything else we well, want to say? No, I mean, I could talk for 20 minutes about Wally. <laughs> we like, already have. Like, they, uh, this was the first Pixar film that I can remember that didn't include a preview for the next Pixar film. I mean, it included the thing for Bolt, yeah, which is Disney. But, you know, I don't really understand. Do they see those as competitors? J- is John Lasseter is over Bolt as well as executive producer of Bolt as well, well, right? I don't think they see each other as competitors anymore. They used to, obviously, I think. I don't think they ever had any uh, connection with one to the other before when Meet the Robinsons came out or Chicken Little. Yeah, Chicken Little, that was the... Well, although Dinosaur came out during the Pixar years and Disney did that. Isn't that weird that they had their competing computer animated film department? Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, and they also had like that really, really skeezy... Like South Korean animation department too, that made like the the awful, awful direct-to-video cheap goals and all that. That's no longer in existence. God bless you, John Lasseter. I wish you were one of our listeners as well. But anyhow, I guess the next one is called Up. And since there is no preview, we still know nothing about right. it. The title obviously doesn't give it away. Um, and then after that, we got Toy Story three. Um, then. Cars 2 was in the, the pipeline. Yeah, in the pipeline. I think really, there's something else before there, that. There's a, 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 a Pixar fairy tale coming out that, right. that's around that, that same time. Anyway, I, we both are huge fans of Pixar. It doesn't really have anything to do with our podcast. Sure. The themes are similar. The we didn't theme, just throw this in. It has <laughs> everything and all things to do with our podcast. <laughs> And there's already rumors about the uh, Wally DVD that it's going to include this short film, like they have lately with his, like the further adventures. You know, the first time they ever did oh, that right, was, right. was the Monsters Incorporated uh, with, with Mike's, Mike's car. new car, uh, which was nominated for an Oscar, by the way. Was it? And this one apparently is about that little robot Mo? on the spaceship that gets locked out when Wally and oh. Eve come back into the ship and goes. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> and bangs on the door. Sweet. And I just thought, dude, That'll be fun. the fact that you could tell a whole story that I want to watch <laughs> about that character that didn't even have any dialogue. Oh, gosh. I, you know, it's like when George Lucas made Star Wars and he had created this universe that was so intricate and so amazing that, you know, that same year we were having Alan Dean Foster writing a spinoff novel and Marvel Comics doing stories that took place in the Star Wars universe and you know the next year we got the worst piece of cinematic trash ever called the holiday special and all that stuff don't you feel like there's some kind of kinship between Star Wars and Wally or maybe I'm overselling it folks but uh... <laughs> there's no way to oversell it it's, I read somewhere somebody went through and they and they'd said you know earlier this year some movie I don't even remember the name of was the best romantic comedy of the year and some other movie was the best sci-fi movie of the year. And then he said, you know, 
that's all out the window. This movie is the best romantic comedy of the year, the best sci-fi movie, and the best film of the year. You know, and I, I agree. I don't know. I mean, I don't see every movie that comes out, but wow. You know, the only animated film I think ever nominated for Best Picture was Beauty and the Beast. And I would like to see that, you know, changed. I'd like to see it too. I mean, maybe that's asking too much. It's hands down the winner is the best animated film of the year. You know, I've always felt like that they introduced the best animated film category to prevent that Beauty and the Beast thing from ever happening again. Do you get that impression? That it's like, well, hey, let's segregate it over here so that we'll never... Oh, the shame of Beauty and the Beast being nominated in 1992. It's like, oh, dear God, what's what's coming next? A horror film will be nominated for Best Picture. And, oh, well, and, and it was, picture. and it won. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, just, wow. I don't know. I, it, it was so many years later that I think you could say that perhaps that, that you know, there's a correlation because... Movies like Toy Story, I don't know, Bugs Life, Finding Nemo comes out, and they're like, crap, you know, we really ought to nominate this for Best Picture. We, you know, but we can't do that. Let's make a new category. And I think well, Monsters they, Incorporated lost to Shrek in the first In the very ever. first. <laughs> you know, it's funny is I'm never going to forget that. I don't know. <laughs> it's like Phantom Menace losing out to The Matrix. Okay, Matrix may be a better movie, but no way in hell did it have better special effects than Phantom Menace. Anyway, I'm just never going to forget that. And that's all right. Send your hate letters to uh, editor at doonsteef.com uh, if you disagree, which I'm sure you do. But, yeah, it's just one of those things where it's like, okay, I know Shrek made more money, but Monsters Incorporated is such a better film. Yeah. And, uh, I, and I realize we've been talking for 15 minutes about Pixar, but if you wouldn't mind indulging us for three more minutes, oh, I am so sick of the glut of computer animated films. And, and you go and see any film that's rated PG, and it's going to have six or seven of these previews for, for Madagascar 2. Or, or Space Chimps. Ooh, or Space I, I, Chimps. I, I, happily Never After last year. Or, mm. or Hoodwinked or one of those things where it's just like, wow, the fact that there's a market for this shows how great the Pixar movies are. <laughs> and my uncle, he buys anything that's computer animated for his daughter. And there's just this giant stack. And you look at it, and it, it it's shite like, like The Wild and, 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 and Shark Tale and Doodle. Doodle. Oh. Google. It doesn't get worse than that, dude. Where do you, I, I can't even, you know, I had forgotten that movie even exists. But the reason it exists is because those movies continue to make money and people keep going to them. And, and we've got a Madagascar 2 and we've got Over the Hedge again or whatever they're calling the sequel. Oh, and we've got Ice Age 3, all of them coming out in the next six months uh, or eight months or, or, or whatever it is. You know, it, it's, it's, I guess it's just one of those things that, that you got to accept when there's something that's really, really good is you're going to get the knockoffs and you're going to get the imitators. And every once in a while, you'll get something that, that is, is good. Battle Beyond the Stars was a Star Wars ripoff that I thought was really good. Piranha was a Jaws ripoff that I thought was really good. But Okay. <laughs> you know, you lost me on both of those, I'm but sorry. all right. Okay, well, we can edit that out. I, I, I never saw Battle Beyond the Stars, and Piranha is a very, very badly done film. Humanoids from the Deep, almost as good. Sure. When, when you and I were kids, Disney, Walt Disney, was the only studio that did these feature animations. And it was an event when one of these suckers came out because they didn't come out every year. And when we were kids, they came out every three or four years, right? Right. And when Pixar first started this thing in 95, that was such a big deal. And I remember when, like two years later, people were saying, hey, the, the guys who made Toy Story are making another one, and it's about bugs. And then some lame wannabes rushed their Bugs movie out six months earlier. Oh, that's another one that my uncle's oh, daughter has. Oh, goodness. Made. But she watches Ants way more than she watches Bugs Life. And that I, I kind of yeah. don't understand. Although Woody I know I've, I've spoken to people that like that better. And uh, maybe it's just a personal taste thing. I, I don't know. Because I'm sure there are people out there that think that Shrek was a much better film than Monster Incorporated. Yeah, yeah I think there are people like that. What really makes me sad... When you talk about imitators, is you know I've talked about how I like to rank the Pixar movies, or you know I've seen uh, quizzes that you can do on the internet where you're supposed to name all the Harrison Ford movies or all the whatevers, and one of them was name all the Pixar movies. And the worst part is when these people they're like 
trying to come up with a Pixar movies, and they'll turn to me and they're like, "What about uh, robots? Wasn't that a Pixar movie?" And I'm just like, "I want to gouge my eyes out." Robots was such a turd. Wait, wait a minute. How about the reef? Um, <laughs> was that a Pixar movie? <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't do it with a straight face. I mean, it's just like there's the high profile. Finding Nemo ripoff, which is called Shark Tale, and then there's the low profile, scrape the bottom of the barrel <laughs> ripoff called The Reef. Yeah, I, I, most people probably have never heard of The Reef. I, I happen to remember just because I walked past the uh, a box, I think it was on like the five dollars or less movies at the Walmart bargain bin or whatever. The and other it's day. not only you can take home the DVD for five dollars or less. You can own the rights to this movie for $5 or less, and they still can do it. They have to grind them up and throw them up to where that big landfill where they have all the E.T. video games. <laughs> Anyhow, we've talked for a while about Pixar. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to talk about or just on that? We're big fans of Pixar, if it hasn't come through yet. We just wanted to make sure everybody knows. Oh, hey, look, our, our little button is flashing. Oh, my gosh. There's the hate letter of the week. It's time for the hate letter of the week. Dear Rish and Big Anklevich, I went to your website, com, and read <laughs> the submission guidelines. At least one of you is a competent writer, it seems. In reading it through, however, I saw no mention of what the word Doonstief means. Could be a... I think that means me, Big Anklevich. Please tell me the origin of the word. Not Rish, please, because he is stupid. Thanks, Carl Bremen. Yeah, keep them cards and letters coming, folks. Oh, uh, well, anyways, Doonstief, um, where, where the word came from, Doonstief was my childhood pet. One time when I was a, a kid, it was barking and woke up my sister. Um, and my sister found that she'd left a candle burning. It started a curtain on fire, and we were able to get it t- torn down and put out and saved, basically saved my fam- every one of my family's lives. So the podcast is named after your, your family dog? I uh, actually didn't think it was a raccoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well spoken, and Bruce. Bruce. So that was our show. Thank you for joining us. Once again, if you want to get a hold of us... Any comments, uh, send them to editor at doonstief.com. You have a story to submit, send it to submissions at doonstief.com. And please do check our submission guidelines before sending it in so that we don't just want to delete your story when we receive it. And yeah, if you have a comment about the story, uh, feel free to drop us an email or leave a comment on the blog. We do pay our authors, so please leave a small donation or a large one. We have a button right on the website, doonstief.com, where you can click and you can say... Oh, I get to say it this week? You can say... I pressed the button. (laughs) (laughs) Right. This has been Big Anklevich. And Rish Outfield. Encouraging you to live in New York City once, but leave before it makes you hard. And to live in Northern California once, but leave before it makes you soft. Good night. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files.